Between 2006 and 2016, over a period of 10 years, the state of Ohio unknowingly became the hunting grounds for a serial killer. A serial killer that had managed to fly underneath the police's radar. The police didn't realize who had been operating right underneath their noses until a victim managed to alert the authorities before he could strike again. Coming up, we listen to the 911 calls, examine the evidence and go through the timeline. All this and more in the case of Sean Great. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Before we delve into this case, I'd just like to give a massive thank you to the people over at Stereo for sponsoring this episode. Stereo is the first live broadcasting social app of its kind, and it allows you to listen to your favorite people's live shows for free. With a growing global community, which is built on collaboration, it gives people a voice and allows listeners to speak freely. Stereo also allows you to take part in the conversations you care about with other like-minded people. With a huge range of genres of shows to listen to at any given moment of time, you will always find a conversation that you want to tune into, listen to and be a part of. You don't need any fancy equipment at all to enjoy Stereo. All you need is your smartphone. Stereo wants to empower everyone to broadcast their voices, which is why they've made it so easy for anyone to be involved. If this seems like something you want to be a part of, make sure you download the app today. To ensure that you don't miss out on any of my live shows, download the Stereo app now and come join me as well as so many other people and creators who are doing their own live shows and who are on my live shows. I'm doing one right after this video goes live, so make sure you tune into that. We're going to be talking about this case and just a little bit of a Q&A. Thank you so much to Stereo for helping to keep this channel afloat. I say this every time that we are luckily, lucky enough to have a brand support us, but it is brands like Stereo that I, that allow us to bring you the content that we do. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do it. You can download the Stereo app on iPhone, Android, Samsung, or any other smartphone by following the link at the top of the description or the link in the pinned comments down below. Um, um, for the people who may, they may not know much about this case, so we can do a little mm, summarization, I guess, of this. Oh, sure. Um, this case is probably one of the, one of the most sens sensationalized cases there is out of America. Um, there's a lot within the case itself. So basically, it's, it's, it, this takes place in um, downtown LA at a... Uh, hotel called the Cecil Hotel. And with all that being said, let's delve right into this case. Nine one one. What is the address to your emergency? By the Fourth Street Laundry Mat. What is it? Fourth Fourth Street Laundry Mat. What's the problem? I've been exhausted. What's your name? How do you spell your last name? Who abducted you? John Green. You said John Green? Sean Great. Where's he at now? Asleep. Do you know where he lives? Just shut the phone down. Are you still 
color. Are you still there? I'm much longer. You what? I'm much longer. Do you hear any officers outside? No. Okay, they're in the area. I'm out of the bedroom. You're out? Okay, can you get to the door where you can see out? No. Huh? No. Can you get out of the house? It's locked. It's locked. Are you at the door? At the door. You're on the door to the right hand side of the house. Yes. Hurry, hurry. Can you unlock the door at all? At 6.48 a.m. on Tuesday the 13th of December 2016, a 911 call was made by a woman who had been kidnapped in Ashland County, Ohio. This woman, only known as Jane Doe to the public for obvious privacy reasons, had been kidnapped and she had been held hostage in a rundown house for three days. In the morning of her third day trapped in the house, she had managed to untie herself and get a hold of her kidnapper's phone. While her kidnapper was sleeping, this Jane Doe crawled over him on the bed and managed to pick up his phone to use it. Now, while on the phone with the 911 operator, the woman accidentally set off a taser that was on the floor. Luckily for Jane Doe, while her kidnapper did in fact sit up in the bed, uh, awoken by the noise, he didn't fully wake up and he quickly lied back down again and fell back to sleep. When the police finally arrived on the scene, they found the woman scared but relieved to have been found. The man who kidnapped her was quickly arrested and taken to the police station for further questioning. When the police questioned them both, it turned out that they had actually known each other for about a month before he had taken her. The pair would often go for long walks together, play tennis and go out for lunch. They both liked the same things. They had a lot, of, a lot in common and would often talk about the Bible and life together. On the day that he kidnapped her, they were out at lunch together when he told her that he had some clothes that he wanted to give to her. So once they'd finished their food and once they'd left the restaurants, they started to walk towards his home. This was when their day out took a turn for the worst. Just before they reached his home, he overpowered her and forced her into the house against her will. She panicked and tried to get away, but eventually she ran out of fight. And in that moment, she remembered her kidnapper saying, quote, you're not going anywhere. For three days, this poor woman was trapped in the house. She was raped and essentially kept as a sex slave. You know, you talked about you abducted her. You've, you've had sex with her against her will too. Yes or no? Yes, I did. What do you call that? Rape. When the police interviewed Jane Doe, they asked her what he had done to her, and she responded that he had sexually assaulted her, quote, in every way imaginable. The man in question was 40-year-old Sean Great. Sean Michael Great was born on the 8th of August 1976 in Marion County, Ohio, to parents Terry and Teresa Great. When he was just six years old, his parents ended up divorcing and Sean's mother, Teresa, was awarded full custody of Sean. During his teen years, he was described as charming and was not unfamiliar with the attention from women throughout his educational career. But his last year in high school would actually see Sean being arrested for assaulting his girlfriend at the time after she had tried to end the relationship. We don't know much more about that arrest charge, but what we do know is that he did graduate from River Valley High School in 1995 at the age of 18, and following that, he kind of just drifted from then on. He did odd jobs around his local area and never tried to really improve on himself. He didn't seem to have any plans for his future. He just seemed to be floating from one thing to the next. He didn't really have any 
any inclination to make his life better for himself. In 1999, when Sean was 23, multiple charges were filed against him from his then pregnant 17 year old ex-girlfriend. One charge describes how he had actually choked her out and in the second charge, he has broken into her home and hidden under the sofa, waiting for her and her sister to come back home. And when they did, he threatened her and her sister with a butcher's knife. Sean's 17-year-old girlfriend eventually did give birth to Sean's first child, a son. Throughout Sean's early 20s, he was in and out of prison for various different reasons and charges, including burglary, alcohol, and assault. In his 30s, Sean became a member of his local church, which is where he met a new woman. She describes that she was smitten with him and sparks would fly whenever they were together. On the 12th of December 2011, when he was 35 years old, Sean Great married his girlfriend, Amber. The couple had been dating for a while, and the wedding was a happy affair, especially as just the month prior, in November of 2011, they had found out that Amber was pregnant. Sean then moved into his now wife's ranch house, which is a house that she owns, and they lived happily together for a few months. That was until things started to go downhill. Sean became a very loud and angry partner, yelling and kicking off about not wanting to do the things together that they had always done before, and things that they'd always enjoyed doing together before. From this constant arguing, Sean eventually became more and more distant within the marriage. He would leave the home for days and weeks on end at a time, leaving an increasingly pregnant Amber alone to fend for herself. This continued all the way up until Amber's delivery day when, shockingly, Sean turned up to the hospital and was seen in and around the hospital while Amber was undergoing an emergency C-section. But when Amber was in recovery from the C-section, she was told by her brother that Sean had been in the hospital but he had already left. So on the 30th of July 2012, Amber brought a beautiful baby girl into the world without her husband by her side. The final straw for Amber in her relationship with Sean was a phone call that she had answered. On this call, the woman on the other end of the phone was asking to talk to Sean. When Amber responded that Sean wasn't there, but she was his wife, she's going to take a message, the other woman told Amber that she didn't know Sean had a wife. Sean had told her that the woman in his house was his sister, who had just had a baby and she was living there so he could help her out with the baby and everything that comes with raising a newborn baby. Basically saying that Amber was his sister and not his wife and the baby wasn't his. After finding out that Sean was a cheat and was cheating on her, and with the absence of him in her and her baby's lives, Amber filed for a divorce. When Amber confronted Sean with this, he just packed a bag and left. He gave her no explanation, he just left. In the coming weeks, Amber would receive threatening messages from Sean, where he threatened both her family and their daughter. One threat he made to their daughter was, quote, if I can't see my daughter, then no one else will. And obviously, and naturally, this terrified Amber, and she ended up filing for a restraining order against Sean. Eventually, things calmed down between Sean and Amber, to the point where Amber was willing to go and see Sean again. She had missed him and decided that enough time had passed for him to maybe miss her as well. So she decided to see him again, which, as you can probably guess, didn't go very well. Sean got physical with her that night and even tried to rape her, but she was lucky enough to be able to get away. That was the last time that Amber saw Sean ever again. That was until his face and name would be splashed across her TV in a news report about his trial. Following his marriage to Amber breaking down, Sean kind of floated through his life. Or so that's what Amber believed. That would be up until the kidnapped Jane Doe had contacted the police on the 13th of September 2016 and reported that Sean had kidnapped her. When the police had arrived on scene at Sean's house, 
they immediately treated it as a crime scene. And the kidnapping of Jane Doe quickly became a catalyst that unwinded a tale of serial murder. Two bodies were found by the police actually in the house with Sean and Jane Doe. They had been found after police interviewed Sean about his kidnapping of Jane Doe. These clips are from the interview, which they played during Sean's trial. Where is she now? In a closet? Which closet? Upstairs? What happened? These bodies were positively identified to be that of Elizabeth Griffith and Stacey Stanley. Elizabeth Ann Griffith was a 29-year-old from Ashland County, Ohio. She was born on the 29th of September 1986 to parents Kerry and Judy Griffith. She was well known in her local area and loved spending her time with other people in her local community. She spent a lot of her time at the Ashland Croc Center and her local church where she attended Bible studies. Sean and Elizabeth would regularly hang out and play games together at the Croc Center. Their favorite game to play was Yahtzee. She took culinary classes at her local career center and was known for her feistiness and humor. Elizabeth was last seen food shopping on Tuesday the 16th of August 2016. She was captured on CCTV in the store. Sean stated in his police interviews that he was just trying to help Elizabeth. The short time I talked to her, she cried several times, just about life and how she couldn't find anyone to love her. All I wanted to do was show her that she wanted to live and I'd say, give me a hug. We're all in this together. Unfortunately for Elizabeth, this hug would be life ending. I'd choke her until she said she wanted to live, and she just didn't. Even though she was last seen in August, she wasn't reported as missing until the 8th of September, five days before her body was found in Sean's house. Sean had killed her, then hid her body under piles of clothes at the bottom of a closet in an upstairs bedroom. The second body found in the home was that of Stacy Jo Stanley. Stacy Jo Stanley was a 43-year-old from Amherst County, Ohio. She was born on the 21st of April, 1973 to parents Charles and Gloria Stanley. She had attended college for nursing and was a loving member of society. Stacy was a family woman through and through. She got married to Michael Hicks in 2005, and together they made a beautiful family. She loved spending time with her children and her grandchildren, but life had been hard to her as she grew up. Stacy was actually a recovering heroin addict and had been clean from the drug for the last six months prior to her going missing. On Thursday the 8th of September 2016, Stacy had been out in the town doing errands. She was seen on Walmart CCTV picking up garden supplies before leaving in her car and heading to a nail salon where she stayed for around an hour. Stacy was last seen by an employee at a BP gas station where she was seen entering the building with Sean. From that moment on, no one ever saw Stacy alive again. A few days later, Stacy's family went into the gas station where she was last seen and showed the employee her image and asked if they remembered her. The employee told them that they did remember her and remembered hearing Sean tell Stacy he could help her with her car. A few days later, on the 11th of September 2016, the police found Stacy's car abandoned on a street a few miles away. Stacy's body would eventually be found naked from the waist down 
under piles of rubbish in the basements of the house Sean was living in. While in police custody, Sean admitted to killing both of these women and to killing a further three others over the past couple of years. The next murder he admitted to was that of Candace Marie Cunningham. Candace Marie Cunningham was a 29-year-old mother of two who was living separately from her children. Candace was born on the 5th of February 1987 in Canton County, Ohio, to her mother, Diana Parsons. Candace's mother stated that she was a loving and caring person who should have had many, many more years to live a happy life with her family. Candace had actually been living with Sean for a few months before his landlord had kicked them both out of the home in June of 2016. When the news broke about Sean, this same landlord actually feared that one of the women that Sean killed might have been Candace. And unfortunately, his suspicions were correct. Sean had actually murdered Candace in June of 2016, the same month that they got evicted from Sean's house. Candace's family never reported her as missing, as they believed she had moved from the area to North Carolina in April of 2016. During his interviews with the police, Sean admitted to killing all of these women and told the police where they would be able to find Candace's body. And true to his words, they did find her remains where he told them she would be. The remains of Candace Cunningham were found near a burned out house in Richland County in September of 2016, shortly after Sean was arrested on the 13th. The next murder Sean admitted to was that of 31-year-old Rebecca Lisi. Rebecca Lisi was born on the 23rd of March 1983 and raised in Mansfield County, Ohio by her parents Linda and Robert Lisi. She enjoyed fishing, camping, and spending time with her children. Unfortunately for Rebecca, she was drawn to a path of drugs from a young age. She never finished high school after becoming a heavy weed user and sadly moving on to harder drugs, including the use of cocaine. Her father stated that he tried to help his daughter, but she didn't want it. She had resigned herself to a life of drugs and held the philosophy of, quote, when it's time, it's time. Rebecca's drug addiction only worsened once her mother passed away, and she ended up working on the streets as a sex worker to pay for her drug habit. Her father even told media that, quote, Becky was a drug addict and she wasn't afraid to tell you, and she was a spunky little brat. She acted like a little girl who didn't get her way. That's a really mean thing to say about your daughter. Not gonna lie. Freaking mean. According to Sean, her sex work is how he actually met Rebecca as they both frequented the same corners. The pair shared drugs and had a casual sexual relationship that lasted a few months. On the day that he killed her, Thursday the 22nd of January 2015, Sean recounted that he had invited her back to his place. But when they arrived home, he confronted Rebecca about 40 US dollars that had apparently gone missing. Rebecca denied knowing anything about the missing money, and when she got angry and tried to leave, Sean grabbed her, which led to a fight between the pair. Sean overpowered Rebecca and strangled her to death before stuffing her body into a large golf bag. He then threw this bag, which contained her body, into the basement for a day and a half while he just continued on with his daily activities as if nothing had happened. He later borrowed a car from a neighbour and drove himself and Rebecca's body to a secluded wooded area. He quickly dumped her body out of the bag and after ensuring that no one saw him arrive in that area, he promptly left. Rebecca was eventually reported missing on the 6th of February 2015, 15 days after she had already met her tragic end at the hands of Sean. Rebecca's body was found on the 16th of March 2015, 38 days after she was reported missing. She was found behind a large tree in a sheltered wooded area that was just off a county road in Ashland County. When her body was found in June of 2015, the county coroner ruled Rebecca's death as a drug overdose and the case was filed as closed. But after Sean's detailed confession of her murder in his interrogation on the 13th of September 2016, her case was reopened and then connected to the other three murders that the police knew about. 
Police knew that Sean had already committed those three murders and they were just piecing it all together. Rebecca's family was hesitant to delve into Rebecca's case again as they'd finally just started to learn how to live without Rebecca in their lives and, and they really, really didn't want to reopen that wound again. They were finally just beginning to move forward with their lives. Rebecca's father, still to this day, doesn't believe that Sean killed Rebecca and had planned to visit the prison where Sean was imprisoned to talk with him face to face as he believed he would actually get a different answer from him. Rebecca's older brother spoke to the press when the case was first reopened by the police and said, quote, I want justice for my baby sister, but I want proof and not a scapegoat for these cops to pin it on Sean if he really didn't do it. The final person that Sean admitted to killing was actually a Jane Doe. During the interviews with police in 2016, Sean admitting to killing another woman all the way back in 2006, but he couldn't remember her name or an exact date. This woman had been selling magazines door to door in Marion County, Ohio. And at that time, Sean was living close to his mother's house. And after finding out that his mother hadn't hadn't received her magazine order from this woman, he decided to take matters into his own hands. While driving in the area, Sean spotted the same woman as she was making her rounds. He pulled over and lured her into his car under the guise that he wanted to buy some magazines from her. He then killed her in the car by stabbing her before he drove away from town and dumped her body in a wooded area. Her body was actually found over a year later on the 10th of March 2007 by a passerby who was collecting cans in the woods for garbage collection. This Jane Doe, this unidentified body that was found in 2007, was nicknamed Vicky by the investigators as she had been found just off Victoria Road. The case of who Vicky actually was went unsolved for over a decade. There was no knowledge of who this woman was or where she'd come from. During the investigation, all Sean could remember was that her name began with D. He believed her name was either Dana or Diana. While in custody, Sean was able to point on a map where he thought he dumped the body of this Jane Doe, which turned out to be the exact same place where Vicky's body was found. For years, the police searched for answers on who Vicky was, they had multiple police artist sketches made over the years. In 2017, they completed a facial reconstruction of the victim, who appeared to be petite and between the ages of 15 and 30, with a long face and rigid jawline. Detectives received hundreds of leads from all around the world. There was never a positive identification which matched to Vicky. This eventually led the police to sending a tooth and a rib of uh, Vicky off to the University of South Florida so that they could do isotope analysis on the bones. This isotope analysis actually revealed why there was no link made between Vicky and the missing woman that had been reported in Ohio. The oxygen levels in the cells of Vicky's bones showed that she was more likely to have been from a southern state. The official report stated that, quote, the oxygen is consistent with the oxygen in drinking water values in drinking water in that area, making reference to the southern states. I for one find it really interesting that they're able to use the oxygen levels within the cells of bones to try and determine where somebody is from. I think that's really, 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 really cool that they're able to do that. But even with this extra information, there was no positive identification made. Finally, on the 4th of June, 2019, the DNA Doe Project, a charity and organization that I support fully and have supported on this channel many, many times, and the charity, which is currently a fundraising link um, on this video, they announced to the public through a series of social media posts that they'd been able to finally find out the identity of the Jane Doe Vicky. The woman in question was found to be 23-year-old Donna Lowry, who was originally from Minden in Louisiana. This identification was able to be made due to a DNA match with one of Donna's daughters. Donna Lowry had last been heard from in May of 2006 when she called her estranged husband to check up on her two small children. And a few days later, after she hadn't called again, she was reported as missing. This meant that after 12 years and two months, the family of Donna, Nicole Lowry, 
were finally able to know what happened to their missing family member. When the press released all their information about this case, just after Sean was held in custody, a number of local women came forward saying how they knew Sean and could testify that he was a violent man. One of these women was his ex-girlfriend, Christina Hildreth. Christina had been in a relationship with Sean for over five years in the early 2000s. In an interview with the media after Sean was arrested, Christina discussed her relationship with Sean and how he was very controlling and violent in their relationship. And I'm just kind of going to jump to the point since we talked briefly. Talk briefly about how were you scared? Were you terrified towards the end of this? What, what was your feeling? Toward the end, it was quite. You never knew what was going to set him off. One, you know, one minute he was happy, laughing, fine. The next minute, you, you know, he's looking at you, evil, and he's just out there. He had just that way about making you very uncomfortable. Your skin crawl. Just, it was really creepy. Take me to that night in June. I know I'm skipping, so yeah. please forgive me. What? You guys had an argument and then we had violence start? We had been arguing pretty much off and on all day. I it started at 5.30 in the morning when I got up to go to work. I mean, it was just, he expected everything handed to him. Um, and if you didn't want to do that, then he'd make things very uncomfortable, you know, pick fights, arguments, anything. And it was like, I was like, I'm done. You know, this needs to be done today. If it's not done, then I'm, I'm done. What you happened? Know? I got home from work. Nothing was done. I'm like, really? You've been here eight hours by yourself. You couldn't do anything. What yeah. did you do? And he starts screaming at me. You know, I was like, I'm like, no, I'm done. You know, just go. I'm done. I, I have no use for you anymore. I said, you need to go. I said, you you make my kids uncomfortable. You make me uncomfortable. When did the violence, what did he do? He grabbed you? What did he do? Um, actually, it didn't get violent until we went to bed. Okay, then what happened when you went we to bed? We went to bed, and he looked at me, and he's like, well, I don't know why you're so mad at me. I said, I'm mad at you because you do nothing and you expect everything. When did he get violent? Show me what and it was And I, I started to get into bed and he grabbed me and he flipped me over the end of the bed and I put my hands up like this and he, and he punched me and he broke my hand. When he punched me, he broke my hand. He had choked me. I had bruises down my face. Set there, you know, and then he, you know, he just like stopped. He's like, well, if you wouldn't have put your hands over your face, I wouldn't have punched you. Then what happened? Then he locked you in the It's like, so then we were uh, sitting there and I looked at my hand and I had this huge knot on my hand and I was like, you broke my hand. I said, how am I going to go to work? How am I going to pay the bills? You broke my hand. I need my hand to work. Then he dragged what And he was like, well, he said, well, I'll take you to the emergency room. He says, go to the bathroom and clean up. I got up off the bed, started to walk to the bathroom. He grabbed me by the back of the pants and the front of the shirt and he threw me into the bathroom. He threw me into the bathtub. And he, you know, I don't know what was going through his head, but he like just kind of held me there and he's screaming at me the whole time. And finally I'm like, you know, I need to go to the, go to the hospital. What went through your mind when he, I had, thought he was, held you there for 20 I thought he was going to kill me. I really did. I, he just had that look. He was very violent, very unpredictable. You know, it just, and then it was like, as fast as the violence started, then it was like, I'm taking you to the ER. So how emotional is this for you telling me the story? It happens. It's just kind of makes your stomach turn. It's kind of gut-wrenching. You know, it's like, and it's just, and it's like, he takes me to the emergency room. And he's laughing and joking by then. He's like, well, you know what? You can shoot me in the face a thousand times with a BB gun. Are you glad that you filed this domestic Yes, Tell me because what. had I not filed that, I would have never got away from me. He would have ended up killing me. I would have never got away. It's like, when I got back from, the, I stayed with my mother for a week. I got back from, you know, staying with my mom, went to go feed my cats, get in my house. I could tell somebody was there. He had run from the hospital when the police came. What did he do? He hid in the, what did he hide? He, had, he hid in the bottom of my sofa. He'd actually climbed up into the bottom of the sofa and he hid there. I had went home to feed the cats. Things weren't right. The toilet seat was up. Food was not where it how, should have been. How chilling is that that he was it's in? It's very chilling because it just, you know, you never know. You think you're safe in your home, and you're not. Let me ask. And your reaction when you found out? It was creepy. I'm thinking, you know, it could have been me because he had held me, he had strangled me, he had hit me, he had threatened me. You know, we'd had a very off and on volatile type relationship the whole five years we were together. You feared for your life. I did, and I had asked for help to get out. Nobody would help. So now, knowing that he is in connection with, he hasn't been charged with murder, but in connection with. 
knowing that there's a possibility that he did kill these women, what what are you feeling? I feel bad for them, but I'm glad that I was able to get away when I did, and I was glad that when I had, did file the domestic charges, that the judge did listen after I had repeatedly asked him keep him there. That I, you know, because people I knew had been locked up with him when he first went, and he told them he would come back to get me. So I mean, it's just I know had he not, had I not filed the charges, had he not set the 180 days in jail and not moved to Mansfield, I would have probably been one of them that they found. How do you keep your composure and everything telling me this? How are you not? How are you not breaking down, knowing? And again, he hasn't been charged, but knowing you just said, you. <laughs> You could have. It's still shock. It's still a matter of being in shock over the fact that one, I dated somebody that possibly killed three people, maybe more. You know, you don't know. Could be more. And knowing that had I not got away, it could have very well been me. So it's just a matter of shock. Knowing I had kids in the house around him, and it, if it wasn't me, it could have been them. So. It's why why did you feel the people need to know that he's not the boy next door like the article that was on facebook someone described him as the boy next door he's not the boy next door in this interview she realizes that looking back on her relationship with sean he wasn't completely normal she believes there was something off with him as a person when she reflected back christina believed that she had actually helped sean clean up one of his murders, which she believed was that of Dana Lowry. Quote, I didn't know he had killed anybody. I had no clue. But I helped clean up his crime scene. The overall thought of helping clean it up, that really does bother me a lot. Christina had helped Sean clean blood up from inside his car, unknowingly cleaning up the evidence of his horrific act. Sean had actually proposed to Christina during their relationship and it was found that the ring he used to propose was stolen from Dana's body. Christina, to this day, believes that there are more victims. She doesn't believe that there were only five people that Sean killed. Another woman came forward, and she was Sean's ex-wife, Amber, who we spoke about earlier at the beginning of this episode. Sean and Amber had been married for a few months, if you remember, in 2011 to 2012, before they had gotten divorced after he had cheated on her. Amber came forward in an interview with Dr. Phil, where they discussed her relationship with Sean, from their whirlwind marriage to Amber getting pregnant with their daughter. So it was just four months and you were married? Yes, it was a whirlwind. <laughs> was that out of character for you? Yes, very much so. Very much so. So you weren't a whirlwind kind of girl? No. I'm still not a whirlwind kind of girl, yeah. for sure. What about him took you that far? Did he push you? He did not push me. With him, I felt a confidence I had never felt before. And I felt a deep, sincere love. And I had never felt that with another relationship. He was attracted to me. He wanted to you know, be with me. And I had never had that before. So I think I just clung on to. You got married what month? December of 2011. He has now said that he had murdered a woman. Yes. He had stabbed her to death, right? Yes, as far as I know. You were with a person that has confessed to murdering someone five, six years before then at that point. Right. Tell me about that. How you feel about it now, looking back on that time of your life? Just complete shock. I, I can't even believe it because at the time, I did not see a violent person at all. I didn't see an angry person. I didn't see any tendencies like that in him. So just a few months after you start dating him, you get pregnant. Right. You say right after you got pregnant, you see a different side of him. I did, yes. Dramatically different. Dramatically different. Tell me about it. Just a couple months after we got married, we were going to church, we were tithing to our church, doing all the things I had always done, and all of a sudden those things made him very angry. He was upset that he had to get ready to go to church, and I told him, you don't have to go, but he would stand in the shower and yell He was just angry about doing things that were normal. What did you make of it at the time? When you said, then don't go, it's okay, I'll go, you stay home. Right. It didn't change, he still got mad. 
How far did the anger go? Did he get violent with you? Did he direct the anger at you? At that time, no. It was a lot of shouting, a lot of yelling, a lot of slamming stuff, but no, he never was physically violent at that point to me. All right. You said he started to pull away from you. He did. Distance he did. himself? Yes. And that wasn't just emotionally. He started being absent from the marriage, right? He would, yes. He would not be there much? Yes. Where was he going? At the time, I didn't know where he was going. I was very naive, and I trusted him very fiercely with everything. So you deliver the child to when? July In of July. 2012. Now, he had been gone, but then he shows up at the hospital. Yes. He so, just pops in the delivery room. And the delivery turned bad quickly, and I was in distress, and she was struggling. So they decided to do an emergency C-section. And I remember looking around the room, and he was not in the room with me. In fact, one of my brothers consoled me during the time that I was really struggling with the epidural. But then, all of a sudden, he was back in the room, and he was in there for the delivery. And then I don't remember him being there the next day. It was just weird. He was in and out a lot. Are you familiar with the term love bomb? Love bomb? No. Love bombing is a term sometimes used in association with cults, in association with really manipulative relationships where somebody will come on to a person, just love them up. That's why they call it love bomb. Mm -hmm. I mean, just overwhelm them with love and care. Love you, love you, love you, love everything about you. Just really sweep you off your feet mm -hmm. until your feet leave the ground. Mm -hmm. And then they flip on you. Yeah. And as soon as they've got you, as soon as you surrender your heart, they turn on you, start to criticize everything you do. They start to take your inventory, criticize you, tear you down mm -hmm. in every way to control you and dominate you. Right. Did that happen here? Yeah, explains it perfectly. That's one of the control factors in a cult. They make you feel welcome, 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 mm -hmm. and then tear you down where you want it back so bad. Right. And you've lost your identity and you want that acceptance again, and it's a, yeah. it's a control mechanism. Right. Sounds very much like that's what happened here. I did that, for sure. Now, you kicked him out shortly after your daughter was born. So you'd had enough. What was yeah. the trigger? I got a phone call on his cell phone, and she was asking for Sean. And I said, who is this? And she said, oh, this is his friend. And I said, well, I'm his wife, what can I do? And she said, I didn't realize you were his wife. He told me he was living with his sister and that she had just had a baby. During one part of this interview, they discussed what Amber was going to tell her daughter about her father. At first, Amber emotionally says that she doesn't know how to explain any of this to her. And your child is how old? Five. Will you tell her about this? I feel like eventually I'll have to. I don't even know how you do that. I don't even know how to address that with her or when the right time would be or any of that. The time to answer her questions, the time to tell her what the truth is, is when she becomes inquisitive mm -hmm. and really wants to know and ask the questions and ask the follow-up. Mm -hmm. Because if she asked the question and, you know, it's like, where's my daddy? Well, you know, we've got a divorce and he's just not in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, she won't ask follow-ups about that until many years from now. Okay. And when she does ask the follow-up, you need to be prepared to give an informed answer because mm -hmm. you, you think about what her questions are going to be. Because he's that way, am I genetically predisposed to be that way? Right. Because he has that capacity, does that make me cold? Does that make me a killer? Does that make me a psychopath? Is that in me? Right. You have to know the facts to answer that question. Mm -hmm. you, you have to not only say, well, no, honey, of course not. Right. You have to say that there's not a genetic predisposition to that. So absolutely unequivocally no, this is something that happened as a function of his march through life. The fact that she has a father that is a confessed serial killer does not make her any more 
likely to do that than the neighbor kid. Right. And you absolutely should protect her from him until she is fully grown and mature. Mm -hmm. And ask the questions and the follow-ups. Right. And then say, now that you want to know, I'll answer it, but I'm going to give you a long answer to a short question. Mm -hmm. And that's when you tell her the full answer. Right. Sean's trial was set for the 6th of November 2017, but was later delayed until the 9th of April 2018. During his trial, Sean gave an emotional plea to the families of his victims, asking for forgiveness. I can't say I'm normal, but you know, I know right from wrong. And I ask you maybe forgive me. Find your heart someday. I know not today, but someday. The trial allowed for the families of the victims to give impact statements of how these murders had affected them and their families. For over an hour, the families of the victims stood up and told Sean exactly how his actions had affected them. You know, you took advantage of that woman and my mother like they were nothing. That doesn't make you a tough guy. It just makes you evil. Real justice would be for you to come with me for about five minutes, burn in hell. You are evil. God tells me to forgive you. And only because he said it, I'll forgive you, but I don't feel it in my heart. You're a sadistic murderer. Sean Michael Grates was indicted on 23 counts, including aggravated murder in the deaths of Stacey Stanley and Elizabeth Griffith, as well as two other aggravated murder counts, two kidnapping counts, and a single count of aggravated robbery. Sean was given the death sentence for these crimes, and his execution date was set for the 13th of September, 2018. Court further orders that each of the death penalties be carried out by appropriate authorities on September 13, 2018, which would be the two-year anniversary of uh, Mr. Great's discovery. After the trial was over, the families of Sean's victims stood outside the courthouse in a sea of purple and sang Amazing Grace together. They gathered on the steps of the courthouse, singing Amazing Grace before releasing balloons in honor of the women. Sean is currently residing in prison, awaiting the death penalty. But the state of Ohio announced in 2018 that no more executions are to be held in Ohio until state lawmakers pick an alternative to lethal injection. On the 10th of December 2020, the state of Ohio upheld the original court sentence of death for Sean Great. But I am unsure of how this is going to proceed and how it's going to go forward. But we do know is that even if Sean is not put to death, he will still be serving life in prison for his crimes. I will never be able to harm any innocent people ever again. Another part of Amber's interview with Dr. Phil showed her reaction to Sean's death penalty sentence. When I think about Sean now, I feel a total disdain and disgust. When you learn the truth, the truth really does set you free. Since then, I have sold my wedding rings, I sold the brooch, I got rid of all of the cards I was holding on to, I even burned my wedding dress. And having found the defendant Sean M. Great guilty of aggravated murder, when the verdict came in for guilty, I didn't feel a relief or anything because I'm not gonna give Sean power over myself or my child anymore. We therefore unanimously find that the sentence of death should be imposed upon Sean M. Great. Hearing Sean get the death penalty is just a finalization for me. There will never be justice for those families and for how he violated me, but I do believe that God will repay what Sean has taken from us and that we have to leave the vengeance to God. I can only hope that the friends and family members of Sean Great's victims can find justice with Sean living out the rest of his life behind bars. And that's everything that I have for you in today's episode. Let me know what you thought of this case down in the comments section below. Again, a massive thank you to Stereo for sponsoring today's episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post a brand new true crime video, just like this one. Follow me over on Twitter and Instagram. My handles are on screen now. Don't forget I'm doing a stereo live show right after this video is finished. So jump over, my link is in the description. Come and join us on there, ask some questions. It's a bit of a Q and A. And with all that being said, I will see you in the next case.